Hello, I hope you're all doing well. My name is Adamantium and welcome to Weapons of Mass Discussion, the intellectual artillery of the TZM activist. I apologise for the seemingly over-intellectualised title, since I was going to use the much simpler Logic Bombs, however I dare say such a title would be flagged up instantly by GCHQ, so this is my feeble attempt at sidestepping the domestic terrorist watch list, even though I probably already am on it. The aim of this presentation is to showcase a collection of logic bombs used to quickly and easily communicate either rebuttals against arguments made against the sustainable train of thought or to detail differing elements of it, in addition to explaining why each angle is used. As usual, I'll give you my disclaimer, which is please don't believe or feel instructed to obey a single word I say. Instead, use what I'm saying as inspiration to do your own research and thus arrive at your own conclusion. So why use logic bombs? First of all, and more often these days, you will notice that as a communicator, you'll be dealing with critics who either don't have the time or the inclination to speak at length about these issues, so I've found just dropping a relevant logic bomb where needed saves time, energy and strained communications. Second, these logic bombs sometimes aren't bombs at all, but are in fact seeds of thought, and planting that seed without having to talk their head off may be more successful in those ideas growing naturally in their own minds. Third, we need to consider the fact that in this culture we're not encouraged to have lengthy, profound discussions, but rather fleeting and superficial chatter where things are explained away using cliches and preset phrases of apologetics such as it's human nature or it'll never happen, among others. After all, lengthy conversations require more knowledge of certain topics, or at least an openness to many areas of knowledge. This is detrimental to the perpetuation of hierarchies like the ones that you see today, because knowledge leads a person to be less controllable. So with that said, adapting our communications when needed to infiltrate that format may prove more successful. As an introduction to the kind of logic bombs I will be presenting, here's an effective means of not only laying that seed, but also taking people off their script of learned social convention. And that is the inevitable question that comes up when meeting someone in a social setting, what do you do? Now experience tells us that what they mean is what do you do for a living? However, when you widen the potential scope of such a question, you find you can apply another angle. So the way I would phrase it is, what do you do? I'm sorry, I didn't mean what do you do for money. I mean, what do you do for humanity? The next one is what I call the job prison. The obvious parallels between employment and the incarceration system aside, this is an issue that comes up in the rhetoric of the establishment and even the anti-cuts movements and unions, whose claim is that we need to create more jobs, specifically for the native residents of those inclined towards nationalism, to solve the unemployment problem. Omitting the fact that jobs are fast disappearing and not coming back due to technological replacement of human labour, systematic shutting down of industries due to monetary constraints and the outsourcing of those jobs to lower paid workers in foreign countries, we seem to think we can create freedom and prosperity by creating more positions of paid slavery. As such, I address this issue with the following phrase. You're in a systematically closing prison and when you're turfed out, do you realise you're free or demand to be locked back up? The only reason why this is a bad news scenario in the current system is that enslavement provides the money which you then use to purchase resources, but considering the fact that off-the-grid living is an affordable and viable avenue for transition to sustainable living, it's not such a bad thing. Next topic is so-called economic growth, an issue that we hear about from politicians, economists and bankers when asked how economies can be salvaged. They say to us that we need to promote growth and at the same time neglect to define growth. 
If they were honest about what growth is, they would have to answer that it is the measure of acceleration of currency circulation, more transactions, more monies and materials changing hands, people buying things and spending more. Which, on the face of it, sounds good. However, Earth cannot sustain an ever-growing and accelerating consumption and waste rate. Earth is abundant, but it's not infinite. Plus, a paradigm based upon the requirement to eat through all the planet's resources is inherently unsustainable. Thus, I would address the issue with the following logic bomb. Infinite growth on a planet of finite resources? There's only one thing that behaves in that exact manner. We call it cancer. So next topic, how do we deal with the snags and difficulties in the transition? Well, as this topic comes up, I feel inclined to remind people that the transition is not something which can be assigned with a concrete plan of action that will be followed through to the letter because everything is always changing and we're not fortune tellers, so we need to adapt and adopt a different approach. This is something I've also covered in my transitional doing presentation last Z-Day. Essentially, the scenario is you're trying to work your way through a huge maze slash obstacle course the size of a football field. It's pitch black so you can't see anything, you can hear voices guiding or perhaps misguiding you, and to top it off the maze is always reconfiguring. That is the reality for the future. So I address this issue in the following manner. In a maze that is always changing, you cannot rely on a concrete preset route. The best way to succeed is to adapt along with it. Moving on to possibly one of the most common claims that come from people when sustainability comes up is the it'll never happen mantra. What saddens me is that a good portion of this rhetoric comes from parents, but I'll touch on that later. After years of encountering this, I realised something telling. The reason people either say it'll never happen or it won't happen in my lifetime is because these people have either completely rejected the idea of anything improving or they project out the point of improvement beyond their likely lifespan so they don't have to personally deal with the necessary changes. And upon further pressing, these people generally do concede that a dismissive attitude towards social change is not the best means to achieve social change. Which is why I answer this with the following phrase. It'll never happen is a self-fulfilling prophecy. In fact, it's the best way to ensure it'll never happen because cynicism isn't progress. Next up is the topic of overpopulation. Many people in this society try to infer that the problem is that there's just too many people. However, a cursory calculation of people to the livable areas of the planet will tell you that there's plenty of room for everyone. So if that's not the problem, then what is it in this regard? Could it possibly be anything to do with the fact that the current model is nowhere near efficient or accommodating and allowing all of us to have a high standard of living? Just a thought. In reality, we could feed everyone if we were to use hydroponic vertical agriculture on just 0.06% of the land currently used to grow food. So to address this issue, I would use the following logic bomb. Considering we can all fit in Texas, the problem isn't too many people. It's the grossly inefficient means we use to create life needs. Next topic is profit versus solutions. And if anyone doesn't recognise on the man on the left, feel ashamed. But this is a very divisive issue. The man on the left is, as you will know, Nikola Tesla, who we all have to thank for the radio, DC power and wireless technology, among a host of other innovations. Despite his eccentricity, he was an accomplished and respected scientist. He had the principles and practice of wireless free energy back in the early 1900s. The problem is, there's no money in free abundant energy. 
so his funding was withdrawn by J.P. Morgan when he found out about the Wardenclyffe Tower project, which is pictured on the right. This project's goal was to implement wireless free energy for the globe. And because money is a factor in the equation, ah well, sorry Tesla, there's no profit in providing for the globe. Enjoy financial destitution. I suppose what stung even more is that Thomas Edison, the guy who electrocuted an elephant by the name of Topsy just to smear Tesla's DC technology, got the financial backing that should have gone to Tesla. So with that in mind, I addressed the issue with the following response. Nikola Tesla's idea for free energy for the planet wasn't implemented because it isn't profitable. Thus, profit is inverse to progress. So on to the next issue, malevolent technology. When it comes to the advancing evolution of technology and how it's portrayed in the media and by culture in certain respects, is the idea that it will act in an emotionless and thus malevolent manner. And if you think that is actually true, ask yourself if the character Spock is a good guy or not. I guess part of what adds to this fear is the rate that technology evolves, which is, by the way, exponentially. Ephemeralization, a term coined by Bucky Fuller, describes how we are doing increasingly more tasks with increasingly less size of tech. This naturally leaves us clunky brain talking monkeys in its wake, and that can be disconcerting, and thanks to films such as Terminator and iRobot, this fear has been fed, even though the malevolence of the Terminators is purely an execution of human programming to kill humans, and Vicky, the machine intelligence in iRobot, being willing to wipe out humanity to save it from itself, was really nothing more than the human nature fallacy. So how I would sum this up is, machines have no malice, but simulations of it. A machine would only harm for two reasons, malfunction or execution of human programming. This next issue was actually brought up to me by a troll on YouTube. Essentially, he claimed that a natural law resource-based economy has the same end goals as Marxism. Thus, they are both the same. The fact of the matter is that Marxism doesn't have the exact same end goals. An argument could be made that any economic system does in the least pretend that eventually, if its principles are followed correctly, that it will result in a happy, healthy and free society. In order for it to gain any real traction when proposed, it would have to. But it's the ends that often do not justify the means. And assuming the end goal is the same, the difference I would emphasise on is that Marxism hopes to achieve cohesion through coercion. And NLRBE works towards creating cohesion through cooperation. Very different. It is the use or absence of use of force or coercion which differentiates the two. And I sum this up in a rather crude but simple analogy. The end goal of a guy on the pole and a rapist is the same, to have sex. The difference is where the force and coercion is used to succeed. Next up is root cause analysis, one of the best tools for problem solving so much so that its applications can extend deep into the resolution of, as far as I can tell, all of our problems. There's three examples that I generally like to use to demonstrate the power of root cause analysis, and that's weeds in your garden, rats in your kitchen, and an operable brain tumour in your skull. The beautiful thing about seeking root causes is that it enables you to truly get at what sets the wheels of any problem in motion, and eradicating that root cause, you eradicate the problem by means of true prevention. So how I address this by just picking one of these examples is, if you had an operable brain tumour, would you want it removed and engage in therapy, or just be fed painkillers and hope it goes away? Next, the topic of our current punishment paradigm, 
upon which I can make an hour-long presentation just by itself. But to touch base on it here, one thing that seems to go completely unnoticed or just ignored is the fact that punishment cannot be used to treat violence because punishment is a form of violence. And our current methods of either physically attacking, which teaches that inflicting physical harm to get what you want is okay, imprisoning, which actually raises the stock prices of privately owned prisons, or executing, because it seems people are irreversibly damaged and thus need to be taken out, these and the other punitive measures we use do nothing to eradicate the problem because, ironically, they show every sign of creating and magnifying violent behaviours. The best place to go to learn how to be violent is prison. So I address this issue with the following response. There is no evidence to support the claim that punishment works because it lacks preventative power. Punishment is synonymous with revenge. Next up is the all too often repeated but seldom understood and even less substantiated claim that we need to work for a living. This is essentially a phrase to propagandize a population into embracing and requiring their slavery. What the government provides you with is posed as the only viable way of doing things and because we enjoy a slightly less overt condition of enslavement compared to other countries, we fall into the illusion that slavery is good and it's okay to need it. And I completely disagree. We have the technology to provide for everyone's life needs and to free them from life-wasting labour. How does the supposed need to work for a living be anything more than unjust paid slavery? So I address this issue with the following statement. We do not need to work for a living, nor do we need the money that that slavery pays us. It is access to what that money would have bought. Next up, we ask the question of whether anyone would need to have so much money it can be dubbed a fortune. And yes, that is a diamond-encrusted Mercedes-Benz that cost $48 million to make and people were being charged $1,000 just to touch it. This is a perfect illustration of the ridiculous lengths that one has to go to to justify having more money than you can know what to do with. And when we step back and just look objectively about the idea of accruing money, it was to ensure that you could meet your needs with comfort. Nowadays, seeking money for the sake of seeking money has become the objective, rather than using money to create systems to provide for all humanity and thus ending the need for it. But for this issue, I choose a comical response, which is... The only circumstance where I would look the other way and in fact support the idea of you being rich is if you were Iron Man. Now there is an additional scenario and I'd say that that is if you were Stanislaw Brzezinski. Moving on to the penultimate issue in this presentation, we have the allegiance to values. This attachment we have to contemporary or even antiquated rhetoric or belief systems is a major barrier to social change. And in fact, for most people, it's the last remaining battlefield that people fight change. The comfort in sticking with the familiar, bolstering your positions and justifying your acts by making claims to certain values have had their day. What all these defensive have in common is to protect the established view against new and improving ideas. For example, the blind patriotism that is illustrated on the left here, where children on a daily basis put their hand on their heart and pledge allegiance to a piece of cloth, assists in prohibiting people from questioning governmental behaviour because you've already sworn to obey and trust the government. Cognitive dissonance expectedly creeps in when the inescapable results of living in an information age clashes with these stagnant values and this can understandably cause people to lose direction. So I address this issue with the following phrase. 
Since everything changes, we are going to portray ideas we've been taught to value because what is taught isn't necessarily what is true. So to close this presentation out, the final issue, the point of caring. This to me is one of the most central points that we as a species need to consider. And if you take anything away from this talk, this should be it. The image you're looking at is actually a genuine English propaganda poster from 1915 that I myself have modified. The original had a quote from the daughter saying, Daddy, what did you do in the Great War? And as you can see, I've updated it to a possible future scenario when we look back on a collapsed anti-economy and we encounter the thought that it could have been avoided if only we cared enough. When we break this concept down, we realise that since we're here, we have an opportunity, and some would even say an obligation, to do what we can to ensure at least a little improvement or contribution towards a sustainable direction for all humankind. So when our younger generations look at us, and we realise that they will most likely be alive after we die, and as such they are having to pick up from where we left off, why would we deliberately or even apathetically do them the disservice of making them pay for the mistakes that we've made? And most saddening of all, this apathetic attitude I see displayed by these people who don't really care about what happens in the future, as long as they aren't personally inconvenienced, is displayed by a hell of a lot of parents. And in some of the most belligerent cases, parents of upwards of three children. They gave birth to all these kids, and yet they could not care about the kind of world they have knowingly brought their kids into. Sometimes this is a case of blind faith in the wishy-washy rhetoric of politicians who have made promises that things will eventually work themselves out and we will have a good life as long as we work hard enough for it. So if you think about it, if you are a parent, then you have more responsibility than even me to do what you can to make the world a better place. Because you have brought a child into this world. Don't you care about what kind of world you've just forced them to inherit? And when we think about that, we can then think about what if my child has a child of their own? The succession of generations beyond our own when applying this train of thought does make us wonder how many generations or how many years into the future are we prepared to care? At what point do we cut off our compassion? And for the parents who claim that a better world will never happen, or at least not in their lifetime, then why did you conceive your children to begin with? So, I provide the final logic bomb for this talk. If we claim to care about our young, it is our duty to do what we can to ensure the world we've forced our young to inherit is a good one. So, if you wish to find out more information, please visit thezeitgeistmovement.com, which now features for free download a comprehensive text called The Zeitgeist Movement Defined, which details exactly what TZM advocates. Additionally, the venusproject.com is a cornucopia of wonderful concepts and designs to make this place better for all. I thank you for taking the time to watch this video, and take care.